Welcome. Welcome to the Baha Four. We are four congregations that know we are stronger together than we are apart. We make up over 600 Unitarian Universalists in and around the Southern Arizona region, from Sierra Vista to Amado to two of us in Tucson. Welcome. We are so glad you are here. Today we're asking a risky question. Is there anything uniquely spiritual or relationally deepening about being on Zoom for an entire year. Now, what inspired this question for me was the many times that I heard the phrase or experienced the truth of the phrase that we've said at Mountain Vista. Wow, I have had more relationships and met more people and had deeper connections than I ever had when we were in person. Or when I hear people say things like, how do we take what we learned on Zoom and carry it into our in-person lives? Maybe these are things you've heard, or maybe you have wondered about them yourself. Now, this service is not a, a Pollyanna effort to make Zoom perfect. I am tired of Zoom, and my heart has been broken by the distances we've had to keep from one another, and I am tired of my little room in this little box and I don't want to be away from each other any longer and I know that this format hasn't worked for all people but what we'd like to share is that our Unitarian Universalist tradition encourages us to see the meaning and make make real and important our lived experiences and here we are in this lived experience. So what kind of wisdom, what kind of spiritual practices has Zoom taught us? And how could we carry that into the many different platforms we will be in together in the coming year? I will light our chalice in the spirit of the question. What have we learned together this year on Zoom and how will it make us different? May our time together be in the spirit of that learning. Now, one of our commitments as the Baha Four is to acknowledge that the land we live on together has a human story much older than the present. And we have spent this year acknowledging the complex, sometimes conflicting, often incomplete acknowledgement of four indigenous communities who are the original inhabitants of this land and still live here today. We honor the Chiricahua Apache, Pascoyaki, the Atham, and Opata peoples. Now we say these names not because saying them somehow makes things right, it doesn't, but because saying the names reminds us and calls us to further action and further relationship. Now the strange thing about being on Zoom is that you might not be sitting with us in Southern Arizona. What are the names of the indigenous people that are on and have been on the land that you also reside on? We hold a moment now to acknowledge the names of all the different communities that are across the United States and beyond that we rest in today. Now, if you don't know the indigenous story of the land you're on, you can go to this website. Let me share my screen. There you go. That website 
This website, nativeland.ca, is a link that you can find in the YouTube notes below the video. This is an imperfect, community-made tool to develop and complexify all of our shared understandings of history and people and land around us. May we be in service to all the places we call home, and may these places we call home be complex, May we practice telling fuller and truer stories. May we practice accountability and may we invite healing through our actions. Let this be a house of Of nature and humanity, of sorrow and elation. Let this be our house, a haven for the healing, an open room for question and our inspiration. Let this be a house of Let this be our house of peace. Let this be a house of freedom, guardian of dignity and worth held deep inside us. Let this be our house, a platform for the be a house of peace. Let this be a house of peace. Let this be our house of When I hear what we call music, it seems to me that someone is talking and talking about his feelings or about his ideas of relationships. But when I hear uh, traffic, the sound of traffic here on 6th Avenue, for instance, I don't have the feeling that anyone is talking. I have the feeling that uh, sound is acting and I love the activity of sound what it does is it gets louder and quieter and it gets higher and lower and it gets longer and shorter it does all those things which I've, I'm completely satisfied with that I don't need sound to talk to me John Cage was an American composer active from the end of World War II until his death in 1992 like a lot of artists in the post-war world, he was struggling with his art, trying to decide what to make of things in the wake of such brutal destruction. And the idea that the world simply couldn't go on in that fashion for much longer. His explorations of music and sound led him down some very interesting roads, including the idea of chance, throwing the I Ching to determine elements of a performance, or including sounds outside the ordinary palette of musical expression, including preparing a piano with screws and wood chunks and rubber erasers to alter the sound. He even struggled with the definition of music and sound and silence and exactly where they overlap and coexist. In the interest of full disclosure, I should say that one of my teachers was a colleague and student and friend of Mr. Cage's. And while Mr. Cage's music hasn't had a particularly huge effect on me, his philosophical approach to sound and art definitely has. In 1951, on a visit to Harvard, Cage first experienced an anechoic chamber, a specially constructed studio lab room that completely blocked the sound of the outside world and immediately muted any sounds that came from within. 
The idea was that the room would be absolutely silent. This wasn't his experience, though. He later wrote, I heard two sounds, one high and one low. When I described them to the engineer in charge, he informed me that the high one was my nervous system operating, and the low one was my blood circulating. He expected silence, but instead discovered that there can never be true, total silence. Even in our stillest moments, we are still generating sound. He continued, Until I die, there will be sounds, and they will continue following my death. One need not fear about the future of music. Now, silence in music was not a new concept. Composers have long been experimenting with long rests and pauses in music for centuries before this, but always in the context of other sounds, never silence strictly for its own sake. But in his struggle for a new definition of music that included found and pre-existing sounds, among other things, Cage latched onto the idea of using silence from the performers to force an audience to engage with the sounds of their surroundings. This had been done in other media before, including notably painter Robert Rauschenberg's so-called white paintings, which presented as blank canvases hung on gallery walls and forced their viewers to confront their idea of what exactly is art. But while paintings and sculpture occupy space, music and the performing arts occupy time. So in 1952, in Woodstock, New York, pianist David Tudor gave the first performance of four minutes, 33 seconds. Tudor marked the beginning of the piece by closing the fallboard over the keys of the piano, reopening it when the time for the first movement had elapsed, closing it and reopening it twice more for the second and third movements. It caused a bit of a stir, to put it mildly. Now, an audience dresses up and goes through the motions of coming to a concert hall with certain expectations. They expect to hear music prepared and played for them by the performers. They certainly don't expect to be forced to listen to nearly five minutes of ambient sound. Cage himself later wrote, they missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence, because they didn't know how to listen, was full of accidental sounds. You could hear the wind stirring outside during the first movement. During the second movement, raindrops began pattering on the roof. And during the third, the people themselves made all kinds of interesting sounds as they talked or walked out. The piece went on to have great influence in the music world and even became a kind of a joke to the people who didn't understand the point of it. It's been performed in many different venues by many different soloists and ensembles. You can even have a look around YouTube after the service, of course, and you'll see lots of different versions for it for every imaginable grouping. It's even been choreographed, first by the influential dancer and choreographer and Cage's longtime romantic partner, Merce Cunningham. A dancer comes out, then sits in front of the audience, unmoving, for the prescribed period of time. As you can imagine, this is a strange thing to experience, especially in a pre-recorded setting like this. Even the idea of a pre-recorded performance of 433 is more than a little ludicrous to me. So I've asked a few friends and colleagues to help me perform this for you. For two minutes, shortened version, I invite you to sit with us in silence and listen to the world around you. Try not to turn inward. This isn't a moment for meditation or zoning out in sacred stillness, but instead turn your awareness outwards and listen to the world around you. The ceiling fan, the air conditioning, the sounds your pet is making, the traffic noise outside, even the sounds of your own body in your chair. We're going to sit and listen for two minutes, and if that gets to be too much for you, the fast forward button is right down there. Here we go.
And here we are. What did you hear? What did you feel? I invite you to perform this piece again for yourself and for your friends. The exact timing and technique don't really matter. Sit quietly and really listen to what's going on around you. Engage with the soundscape of your world. Listen to the silence and hear what it has to say to you. Thank you. Hi friends. If you've attended any of our uh, second hour events or other programs or Vespers, you know that one of the Zoom skills that I've perfected over the pandemic has been screen sharing. So I will share videos, oftentimes PowerPoint slides. Um, many times people just show up at an event and they say, can you screen share this thing? And the answer is almost always yes. Um, I've, I've gotten accustomed to screen sharing and one of the ways that I've done that is by having two monitors. I have a monitor here and I have a, uh, my laptop over here. So I've definitely increased my capacity to be able to share screen. And so as we were thinking about Zoom as a metaphor, a screen share came to me because when I first started doing screen share, it felt very personal and very vulnerable. Because if I hit the wrong button and share the wrong thing, it might not show up. I might forget to turn on the sound. I might forget to share the right screen or not hit the right button. Or you might see all of the mess that's sitting on my laptop desktop, um, which is commiserate with the, the rest of the mess that you don't see that I hide on Zoom around me. So screen share is a very vulnerable activity. Um, and I have been fortunate enough that when I screen share, people respond with grace and empathy, which made me think about this video I want to share. This is Brene Brown. Some of you have heard her talk about empathy before. So here's a screen share of Brene Brown and empathy. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us, that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection.
So yeah, screen sharing for me is a way to connect and a way to deepen the empathy with others. I'm literally seeing through somebody else's eyes when I screen share, and I'm allowing you to see through my eyes when we screen share. And maybe I'm not screen sharing something serious, but like Brene Brown says, that by taking the perspective of someone else, by sharing their sacred space, that connection can make it better. And so screen sharing reminds me that I need to live into empathy when I'm interacting with others around me. Here's my pitch. Zoom has taught us new ways of being in relationship. Now I know it's been hard and I know it's not everyone's preferred way of being together. And I also know some of us have chosen not to participate in Zoom because it doesn't work for how we listen or how we learn or how we relate. So there have been real losses because of this platform. This is not a homily romanticizing Zoom. Instead, I want us to sit with the lived experience of Zoom. And I invite us to think of Zoom like some kind of, you know, unexpected, imperfect group facilitator of our community's experience this year. And like any facilitator of any kind of group process, it will not meet all of our needs or our people. No facilitator can. And like any facilitator of a group process, it can reveal to us the ways we might want to be in relationship differently because it asked us to try on a different way of being for just a specific period of time. So today, let's take seriously the question many of us have been asking ourselves. How is it that I can have deeper and more relationships on Zoom. And how do I do that when I start meeting with people in person? Now I'm gonna hone in on three spiritual, relational uh, teachings of Zoom that I have found meaningful for my future life. And there are absolutely many more and perhaps a good question for you after you watch the service is what are your spiritual and relational teachings from Zoom? But we'll start with mine. Here they are. Embrace what you do not choose. Risk revelation. Stay in the room longer than you expect. So Zoom spiritual practice number one, embrace what you did not choose. Here's how it looked. You show up in Zoom, you found the ID and the link, you log into the meeting, someone is the host or the co-host, and they have the power to mute you, unmute you, prevent you from chatting on the side. I see you, I do it too or make it so that you have to focus on certain faces or hear certain voices or see someone's screen. And then horror of horrors, 
They have the power to put you into a small social group breakout session with people you did not choose. This is a spiritual practice. Can you believe, can you believe that we let people do that? On Zoom, we have this temporary shared willingness to not be entirely in control of our social experience. And we choose to embrace things and people we did not choose. So this is the first spiritual practice, embracing what we don't choose. Now, besides ministers or worship associates forcing you into small groups after services on Sundays, I've been thinking about the ways each of us on our own, making choices about our own behavior, could take this practice into our lives and relationships. So here's one kind of wild idea for going back to in-person. Imagine if before you leave your home on Sunday, should you choose, of course, to participate in person, or maybe you'll stay on Zoom, but let's say you're going to participate in person. Before you leave your house on Sunday, you imagine the building you're going to empty. The pews or the chairs, the coffee hour space, the socializing spaces. Imagine it all empty. Then, in a spirit of meditation or prayer, you pause. Like a museum, you let yourself be drawn to a different place where you might sit or stand or snack or sip your drink that day. And before you arrive and before you see who else is sitting or standing there, you commit to whatever might happen in that pew, that chair, or that table. Is it a wild idea? Totally. But I think that experience is possible. The risk, embracing the risk of not being in total control of what happens next and inviting it to come to you. Now, I had an experience like this when I was a chaplaincy intern. I was a chaplain at a bustling nonprofit for folks who were just coming out of incarceration. And there were hundreds of people there every day. Now, as the chaplain intern, it was my job to have spiritual conversations with people um, and learn from them and grow and, and build relationships. And so I spent my first bit of time chasing people through the nonprofit, trying to have profoundly deep and meaningful conversations. I'd follow them into offices or classrooms or beg them to talk to me on stairwells. I kind of tried everything. And finally, a mentor said to me, I think I have a suggestion for you. Perhaps you try too hard. Perhaps what you need to do is pick a chair for the day and sit there. That is exactly what I did. Now, releasing my need to control what would happen around me, who I wanted to talk to or who I thought I needed to talk to, and choosing instead to make myself available to what I did not choose and to see it as a gift was a spiritual practice. Now, when you find the chair, we get to Zoom spiritual practice number two, risking revelation. Now, our Baja 4 music coordinator, Chris Tackett, used to start all of these services with the phrase, welcome to my living room. Now, that experience, Zoom, at the beginning was a strange thing for all of us. We're used to meeting in public spaces, but suddenly we're Zooming from personal offices and kitchens and bedrooms, that's what's behind the screen, and sofas and patios, and we saw fragments of each other's lives. We saw family members popping in and out. We saw each other's personal prayer or meditation spaces or bug collections or book collections or gardens. We saw sweatpants 
and sleepy faces, of course. And the reality is that that blurred boundary, that now we were suddenly everywhere, was a great stress for many of you, many of us, especially for those of you with families at home, navigating being on your computer, children on other computers, trying to keep it all together. There was definitely loss. The gain, I think relationally, is that we were invited to practice new forms of revelation, revealing ourselves and risking a kind of intimacy that is more challenging to do in public space. Now, some of that was about being in each other's personal spaces together, but some of that was also the choice to reveal who we are when we're less defended and powdered up for public space. And some of that was also our willingness where we relinquished some of our control to receive powerful questions and prompts that guided us there. Now, one activity we did at Mountain Vista was a Zoom scavenger hunt. The leader of the scavenger hunt on Zoom would name intriguing categories of items that then Zoomers had to go find in their homes. For example, it'd be like your favorite coffee mug or something, uh, something someone important made for you or a thing that represents how you were in high school or um, a thing that represents a spiritual need that you have right now. And they would give this list and then people would have five minutes to go scurrying about their houses to gather up the items. And the things that they brought back were things that we probably couldn't have done as well if we asked them to bring them to a sanctuary. People came back with treasures from their lives. They told stories, often with tears. And they would reveal things about who they were that public space might normally make more difficult. And of course, when you reveal who you are, you might be unsurprised, but also surprised to find the revelation mirrored back for you. So the wisdom there then is this, that to build relationships that matter, that feel deep, we have to risk sharing the things that matter to us. Now, we don't need a skilled facilitator to make prompts for us, although of course it helps, but each of us can choose to ask each other questions that lead to revelation. We do this first by noticing what matters to us, what is tender or what is hurting, what touched our hearts in a service? What brought us to tears? And if we can touch that place in us, the next move is to risk inviting it in others. The practice is risking asking as much as it is, is risking revealing. This is intimately tied to Zoom spiritual practice number three. Zoom spiritual practice number three is stay in the room longer than you would have. So how it looks on Zoom, we embrace the risk, we give our power over to a host and co-host, we're put in a small group breakout room, we're in a conversation with people we didn't choose, very often about topics that we didn't choose. Wow. The task, once we get there, is to stay in the room. Fully present. Muted. Choosing very intentionally. When we unmute. This is not a simple task. It is easy to find a reason to leave the room especially when we didn't choose the room. In our culture of politeness that sometimes errs on superficiality, silences or missed connections or discomfort or difference can be totally acceptable moments where we have permission to start looking for the exit door. But politeness in our church communities isn't our goal. 
Covenant is our goal. And covenant means choosing to come together to practice a different way of being in relationship. So an ethic of risk and a practice of revelation is made valuable and is made whole by an ethic of presence. When we risk being in a situation we didn't control, and then we risk revealing ourselves, and we risk inviting revelation from others, we have to stay in the room present long enough to really witness what shows up there. Now, this might mean choosing to stay in it with a person we have resisted or distanced ourselves, or maybe a person we've felt some disconnection from. It might mean choosing to stay with a conversation that ebbs and flows and pauses without rushing to fill the space or rushing to leave the space. And it definitely chooses, looks like choosing not to make ourselves just busy with the busyness of church. And I think it also means resisting the feeling like we have to say hi to everyone on Sunday morning and that we really begin to give ourselves permission and to value what it's like to be present with a few people on Sunday morning while being held among the many that we care about. And for those few people that we choose to be present with, to not be our closest friends that we will probably see later that week anyways, but for it to be the few that helps us widen our circle of care to include genuinely more people, meaningfully, every Sunday. Stay. Stay in the room long enough to find out why it was important that you were there. So there you have it. My thesis on three Zoom spiritual practices. Embrace what you do not control. Risk revelation. And stay in the room. Now the potential, if we are to practice what this might mean, in our non-Zoom relationships, I think is powerful. And it reminds me of a Marge Piercy poem that I'd like to close with called The Low Road. Now, Piercy is a feminist writer and the longer version of the poem that I won't read today imagines all the hard things that happen when we choose to go it alone. But slowly, Marge Piercy builds up the poem to suggest what's possible when there are two and then when there are three or five or 10 or 20 or a hundred or a thousand or millions gathered. And the invitation at the end she writes is this. It starts when you say we, and you know who you mean. And each day you mean one more. It starts when you say we, and you know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. So may this be the blessing. May the deepened relationships we found when we embraced what we could not control and when we risked revealing who we are and we stayed in the room long enough to find out why it mattered that we were there. May that carry us into a future where we practice that in every encounter. And may it mean that our congregations become places where we say we, and we know who we mean, specifically, intimately, vulnerably, and deeply, each Sunday. And each Sunday, we mean one more. Better times, better times will come. Better times, better times will come.
Let me get one last look at you. Is that your real room? What is that background? I've noticed that some people linger in our church buildings. The people who stayed beyond worship and social hour often were the ones who were cleaning up or downing the coffee or in the corner in a deep conversation. But it still happens here. There are still people who stay on after the Zoom meeting for that last bit of conversation, connection, community. So I want to ask you in our last few moments, what have you learned from this year on Zoom? Have you stayed longer in this room than you might have? Have you had deeper conversations with people you might not have before? What have you learned? And what have you learned from these 15 months? I've learned that I like meetings where I get to see faces intently looking at me and I get to gaze at each person while we talk. I love meetings where each person speaks one after the other, only ever speaking over each other when an unstable internet causes hiccups. And I've learned from this year that the world is full of vulnerable, valuable humans, that our beleaguered planet is beautiful and needs protection, that there are voices on the margins that I hope to listen to intently. That is my hope for this world. What are you going to take away after these 15 months? What are you going to take forward? I value human company. And I have also learned that from wearing something as simple as a mask, I can do simple steps that make big differences. So I'm sorry I can't make you co-host so you can stay on, but I hope the sounds and sights and words of this worship linger in your heart and mind and nourish you. I hope you go forth knowing just how valuable, just how loved, just how needed you are. Okay, how do I leave this meeting? Um, oh, there. <laughs>